Good day and welcome to Miss Clark Reads to You. Today we are in Chapter 9 of Death Watch by Rob White and we will be taking notes on the details in the text so that we may write a detailed summary of this chapter with gory or grotesque details. A curious thing has been noticed about people who are dying of thirst. The dehydration of their bodies is so extreme and the loss of salt so serious that, that the consistency of their blood changes radically. Sweating eventually ceases and the mucous membranes, usually moist and full of fluid, dry up and peel off. There is no saliva in their mouths or throats and even the corners of their eyes. Always flowing with moisture in normal times become so dry that any speck of dust in their eyes causes excruciating pain. And yet, if these people are rescued before they die, even people in the last moment of life and completely dehydrated, they almost always cry. And for some mysterious storage, and from some mysterious storage, real tears flow from eyes that a moment before were bone dry and painful. No one knows where these tears come from. Ben sat on the floor of the tunnel, his back against the curved wall of it. It was not a lake. It was a puddle of water, about 15 feet in diameter and not more than two feet deep in the deepest part. All around this puddle, bird droppings had caked the floor and the water itself was not as it seemed sparkling and clear. It was murky and had a stale, almost dusty taste. It was delicious. Lying on his stomach, Ben had drunk as much as he could. Then he had rested and drunk again. It was though he had actually felt this water flowing straight through the walls of his intestines and being taken up by his blood and distributed through his body. He had drunk once more and then asleep almost before he rolled away from the puddle. He had lain there beside the water. Ben felt now the way he had as a child when he was awakened by some nightmare and his mother had been there to comfort him. He had never known that comfort in his uncle's house after the death of his parents, but he felt it again. Now as he sat beside this little puddle, the smell of guano strong around him. So this would be a moment where I would reflect upon two things. The first thing I would reflect upon is Ben's death of his parents and that it was his uncle who raised him. And then if I didn't know what guano is, I would take a moment, go to collinsdictionary.com, and I would type in guano to see what that means. His tongue had shrunk to its normal size. His throat, through, though raw, felt good. His eyes were wet again, and he felt strength in his body. He was hungry. Since the first night on the low range of the mountains, he had not felt particularly hungry, and in the last hours had felt no hunger at all. But now his stomach was gnawing at him. The intensity of the light had changed as he slept. Now the strongest light came from the end of the tunnel at which he had entered, and the far unexplored end was only a dim glow. So if we think about Ben in the tunnel, Okay, so this was the funnel out here that he used the velodrome, okay? Then he got in the tunnel. Here's the lake. So this tunnel, the light is dimming. He has not explored the full range of the tunnel yet because he has been sitting here drinking. the lake. Even his feet didn't seem to be so painful as he got up and walked around the puddle and on down the corridor. So this is a tunnel or it's also being called a corridor. As he neared the end, he noticed where the ancient waves had worn the outer wall very thin in places eating all the way through it so it looked like a great slab of brownish cheese pocked with little holes. So in this tunnel, a little, like if you know, uh, like there's little holes in here 
where some light is streaming through. Okay, um, and he, it's the way he's a great slab of brownish cheese pocked with little holes, and that is a simile, like a great slab. The tunnel ended raggedly, the outer wall breaking up as the tunnel widened so that beyond it he could see a wide open ledge of stone slanting upward about 15 degrees and ending at what was apparently the top of the butte. So this has a ledge that slants up, okay? And then the top of the butte, the butte continues. Okay, all right, and this is the ledge. Ben started to walk out on the open ledge, but then for the first time in hours, thought again of his enemy. Maidick knew that he was somewhere on the butte. He would be waiting for just a mistake as this. Ben went back into the tunnel and got one of the Sotil sandals. Then he knelt beside a small hole in the outer wall and slowly slid the sandal out across the opening. No bullet wrecked into it. No sound rolled up from the desert. He tried a larger hole. With the dark tunnel behind them, these holes might look to Maedic like the only dark splotches on the stone surface. Like only dark splotches on the stone surface. He lowered the sandal and slowly moved until he could see out through the hole. So he's poking the Sotal sandals out through the hole, the little Sotal sandals, to see if Maedic, who's somewhere out here in the Jeep, uh, pardon my poor drawing of the Jeep, if Maedic sees this and is going to shoot at it. Uh, let's see. Maedic was down there, sitting on the hood of the Jeep, studying the butte with the binoculars, the 358 across his lap. Ben sat down in his puddle of water, beside his puddle of water. For a long time, he stared at the perfectly calm surface of it. It was the only weapon he had. Water which gave him time. If he could get some food, it would add to his life. He picked up the slingshot and carried it back toward the wide end of the tunnel until he found a spot safe from Maedek. There he cleared off the small pebbles and debris and sat down. He noticed as he did this that his muscles were beginning to feel very stiff and painful and that as he stooped, his back and his wounded arm ached. It was the best slingshot he'd ever seen. The hand fitted exactly into his hand. The yoke was a wide, strong U of tubular metal from the base of which the brace went down the inside of his wrist to the curved metal piece which lay against his arm, almost halfway to his elbow. And there was little strain of it on his fingers with the palm of his hand, even at full pull of the powerful rubber, rubber tools. There was no shaking, no wavering. Picking up a small pebble, he fitted it into the leather pouch, drew and let go. The pebble whistled out into the sunlight, hitting the wall of the butte and whining away into the air. Gathering a little stock of pebbles, he began to shoot, aiming first at a spot close by on the wall. But as he learned to hit it with almost every try, picking targets farther and farther away until he found the extreme range of accuracy of the slingshot. Then as the light slowly faded, he just sat and shot the thing, stone after stone, more and more pleased with it as his accuracy improved. He got so he could pick up a stone, pouch it, draw, shoot, and hit his target with what seemed to him remarkable speed and accuracy. At close range, the slingshot was lethal. The rubber tubes were so powerful that at full draw, Ben was sure the pebbles started out with as much velocity as the pellet of a good air gun. Confident with it of his ability, he at last decided to waste one of the heavy lead buckshot, wondering what difference the smoother shape of the buckshot would make. It made a lot. He wasted five more of the lead bullets, finding out how much flatter their trajectory was and how much more velocity the round shape gave them. 
Ready, he moved back into the tunnel, taking a position beyond the puddle so that he was almost in darkness. Arranging himself so that he would not have to move anything but his fingers, drawing the pouch back, he loaded it with a buckshot and then sat waiting. The first bird was a sparrow hawk. It wheeled straight into the tunnel and straight out again, banking in a sharp whistling turn about five feet from Ben. Discouraged, Ben sat watching the empty disk of sky. He could see down the tunnel. Not a bird appeared, not even in the far distance. Had they stopped using this water hole? Were all these droppings old? Was there water somewhere easier for them to reach? Hmm. Ben did not see them flying or see them light. They were just suddenly there, a covey of gambel quail, walking without any hesitation into the tunnel and on toward the water. They were talking to each other in a low, soft, fluty chatter, the little curved plumes on the heads of the males bobbing up and down as though they were nodding in agreement. He let them come until they reached the water, and then, picking out a male, standing alone, dipping his beak down, and then raising it high as he let the water run down his throat, Ben drew slowly, aimed, and released. The bird dropped where he stood, a little dust of feathers settling on him and a little cloud of dust rising as he kicked feebly and Ben lay still. It did not alarm the other quail at all. Some glanced at their fallen companion but did not stop drinking. Ben eased another buckshot into the pouch, drew and shot. He did not hit this one as cleanly, apparently striking bone. And the buckshot knocked the bird backward a foot or so but killed it. He did not miss a single shot. When the birds had drunk enough, they turned and walked, still chatting out of the tunnel, leaving five dead on the floor. He gathered them up, took them to the funnel and where there was more light, they were still warm as he plucked them. The feathers remarkably hard to pull out. The little carcasses looked pitiful as they lay in a row on the rock, the heads unplucked, the gay plumes limp now and colorless. Ben tried not to look at them as he gouged them open with his thumbnail, their juices covering his hands. He debated about throwing the entrails away, but at last did, thinking that other quail would be back for water in the morning. Ben looked at the raw, bloody thing in his fingers, the bones showing ghastly white in what was left of the sunset. And then, with his eyes shut, gagging, he put it to his mouth and he tore the flesh off with his teeth. Close to nausea, he did not chew at all, just swallowed the tough, slimy stuff, forcing his throat to accept it. He ate them all, the process getting no easier. When they were all gone, he looked at his hands dark with blood and he felt the blood around his mouth and almost lost the meal. I can't go on doing that, Ben decided. If the birds came back in the morning, he would dress them out and then put them in the sun. No matter how hungry he felt, he would make himself wait until the sun on the stone had cooked them at least a little. His mind went on, dealing only with small things, not wanting to deal with the one enormous thing, which as he slowly admitted it into his thoughts, was like the darkness creeping up the side of the butte and into the tunnel. I love that imagery at the end, that no, no one made it goes out there, is like the darkness creeping up the side of the butte and into the tunnel. It's inevitable that he will have to face Maedek being out there. He's got to figure out his next move. So now you'll take a few minutes and you'll jot down some of the key details in the text, and then you will write a summary, including some of the gory details. Thank you for joining me. This is Death Watch by Rob White, and that was Chapter 9. I look forward to reading to you again.